Greetings Bibliophiles, welcome back to the book thing and another of those uh, novels that I picked up with the, the book voucher I got, I think I mentioned this in an earlier video, I got a, a book voucher as a late birthday present and bought a whole bunch of books that were a little bit outside of my comfort zone as it were, stuff that's from authors I don't know, um, stuff that's a bit more contemporary, a bit more recent because uh, a lot of the time I tend to go to the stuff that I know I'll enjoy, authors I've already read or stuff from decades past. Uh, the, generally speaking, sort of the 50s through to the 70s is my kind of era because that's, that's the, the, the kind of sci-fi that I grew up reading. So the book in question this time is The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers, which I believe was originally published in 2014. And uh, it picked up a fair bit of praise when it came out because uh, overall it's a pretty good book. And it's a little bit unusual because although it takes what are in some ways some quite familiar sci-fi tropes, uh, it mixes them together in a way that is quite interesting and uh, the, the actual prose itself is very, very approachable. It's very uh, readable stuff. It, it, it It's not like some sci-fi that I enjoy where okay the ideas are great but you really have to hack through the pose uh, the, the prose to get at it so you know for some people just that is enough to to put them off but that's definitely not the case with small angry planet so the basic plot is that uh, Rosemary Chambers, uh, Ro Rosemary Chambers, what? Rosemary Harper, where did I get Chambers? Oh, the author's name, obviously. Uh, Rosemary Harper turns up on the Wayfarer, and the Wayfarer is a tunneling ship, and uh, it, it basically is um, one of those vessels that creates the part of the FTL infrastructure in this particular imagined universe. Uh, it, they don't have... Uh, FTL like hyperdrive or whatever from Star Wars. No, it, it basically, uh, it, in the context of this universe, um, is all around wormhole technology more or less. It, is, it involves punching through um, from from one bit of space time to another bit of space time, and it needs these specialized ships to do it. And they kind of open up these highways so that other ships can then use those. So um, she joins aboard this ship, and uh, she's got quite a lowly job in some ways she is the ship's clerk uh, but she also has some other skills that are uh, quite useful in terms of um, languages and, and cultural knowledge that proves uh, to be um, handy along the way at several points but also in some ways she's quite naive because um, she's from Mars which is a, a rich human planet and um, we learn quite a bit about her as we go along, but she had quite a privileged upbringing, and so going out into the, the wild universe, even though it's on board this um, quite friendly spaceship, uh, it's a bit of an eye-opener for her, and that's not really anything... Like, that. that's a, a fairly standard thing, is you have this new character come aboard a ship or, you know, come into a new job or whatever, and so everybody else gets to explain stuff to them and, by proxy, you, the reader. But it doesn't do it in a condescending way, and I think it it doles it out at a sufficient kind of uh, level that it doesn't overwhelm you with stuff, and it, it, it kind of... Like, some, some books, like, there's, there's one of the books I have to, um, yet to cover, Nine Fox Gambit, where it just pushes a lot of stuff at you at once, a lot of jargon, a lot of, of stuff to do that, with the particular universe of that book, and, uh, it's a little overwhelming, you just kind of have to bear with it until you pick it up from the context largely, but uh, uh, Small Angry Planet's a lot more approachable in that sense. It doesn't thrust this massive, unfamiliar universe on you all at once. It, it, it unfolds it slowly, and um, as they're going on this journey, on this tunneling ship, because basically they get given a contract which involves a great big long journey at the end of which they will be making a tunnel, and traversing a heck of a lot of space um, a, a lot quicker than it took them to get to that initial point to begin with, uh, hence the, the, the long way part of the uh, the title. Um, as as she goes along, she learns not only about her crewmates, but also about the the different species they represent as well, because it, it's a, a multi-species crew, and it's a multi-species universe. And not all of the species get along, but it's a little bit like... 
say, um, Star Trek or maybe um, the kind of Mass Effect universe might be a, a, a better comparison where there are all these, these major species that more or less get along, but some of them get along better than others and some of them um, integrate with certain other species better than others. So uh, the fact that, that she's on a, a, a multi-species crew, um, it does become relevant at various points and it actually goes on to explore... Um, what that might mean in a way that a lot of sci-fi doesn't. Because a lot of sci-fi just kind of ignores that side of thing. The fact that you might have um, different species crew members having to, to coexist and uh, having to make concessions to coexist. Um, there's a bit of that in Star Trek. You know, that was the thing that sprang to my mind. You had particularly um, Worf let's say, in The Next Generation as being one of the outsiders, and also, to some extent, Data as well. But more particularly so, Odo in DS9. And with Odo, they really did explore the fact that for the for the shapeshifters, as they are, these uh, beings that can assume really any form they want to, uh, it's, a, it's a different mode of existence. It's a different way of living, and it's hard to, to relate in a lot of ways uh, uh, to, you know, all the other species that can't do that. And it, it it kind of goes down that route in that it over time becomes apparent the the concessions that, you know, different species have to make to, to live together and that uh, it's not always an easy thing. So they have this journey, they, they go and do their job and there's a little bit of peril along the way. But generally speaking, that's not really what this book is about. It's not particularly about conflict, even though there is a little bit of conflict. Um, there is a little bit on board the ship with one of the particular characters who inevitably by the end comes round to being a bit friendlier, which was a little bit predictable, but okay, it's fine. Uh, but there's also some conflict related to the job that they have to undertake, and I won't talk too much about that, because it would kind of spoil the ending. Uh, but that really is the only point at which they, they come under any kind of major peril. Uh, for the most part, though, it's generally them all getting along and just kind of learning about each other and... Um, particularly Rosemary learning about the wider universe, because humans are not particularly special. She's gone down that route, Rosemary Harper. She's made humans just be kind of like the latecomers. They're a bit bog standard. They don't do anything particularly interesting or special. Other species are known for for being um, quite far ahead of the sciences. There's one of the species that's very well known for just having lots of money, basically being very wealthy as a as a society as a species and humans are just kind of like eh they're just kind of there in the middle they've come onto this galactic scene and they've, they've found kind of a place for themselves but um they don't seem to really stand out in any way and that's a bit of a trope in sci-fi as well as i said at the start there's there's a fair few quite familiar sf tropes but um, just because something is a trope just because something has been done plenty of times before doesn't mean that it can't be given uh, an interesting new gloss that it can't go off in a direction that you haven't necessarily seen before. And I, I, I won't say it does truly go off in an original direction, but it was a very pleasant, enjoyable, entertaining uh, read. In fact, it was quite endearing. I think that's the word I'd use particularly about it, because um, you really do get to root for these characters. Uh, you do get to quite like them, apart from the one guy that's a bit of a jerk that comes round by the end, of course, because of course he does. But um, yeah, otherwise, uh, I really did quite enjoy this. It was quite quick to get through. And as I've said, it was quite an easy read. And uh, although it um, it doesn't really explore any grand ideas, uh, it does maybe explore more of that sociological side, as I've said. And that's that is a bit different. You know, there's not a lot of sci fi that that um, takes that as its focus. Um, I'm trying to think of any notable examples. Um, Left Hand of Darkness, that's a good example of, of one that kind of explores a culture clash by uh, Ursula Le Guin, of course. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's 
it's it's a reasonably unusual thing for a sci-fi book to do and it has made me want to go and read the sequel because there is a sequel to this with the same characters and um i don't know if there's going to be a third one after that if the plan is for a trilogy or maybe just to keep the series going i don't know but it's an interesting enough universe and an interesting enough set of characters that you learn about that that grow as the story goes that i do want to keep reading about them in future so uh, i absolutely will be getting the sequel at some point so the bit i've chosen to read out is from where they're making their first punch as it's called this is basically them forming a kind of um a pilot tunnel essentially and uh because rosemary doesn't know anything about it they get to explain it to her and i thought this was a, a reasonably good bit to uh to to share because it's it's reasonably early in the book and you get some taste of uh, what the dialogue is like because it's it's quite a dialogue heavy book in in a lot of ways well just it is dialogue heavy. I don't know why I'm saying a lot of ways there. So, Kizzy said, turning her attention to Rosemary, this is your first time tagging along for a punch, right? Sorry, uh, a what? Rosemary said. Kizzy chuckled. That answers my question. A punch is the act of making a tunnel. Oh, right. Rosemary sipped her tea. Slightly sweet, nothing special. Okay, so it was a little boring, but comforting nonetheless. There's a whole thing earlier on about boring tea and caffeinated tea, and so, yeah, that's a little reference there. I was actually wondering... She paused, not wanting to sound stupid. I know I'll never have to help out with the tunnelling stuff, but I'd like to have a better understanding of how it works. Kizzy pressed her lips together with excitement. You want me to give you a crash course? If it's no trouble, that is. Oh, stars and buckets, of course it's no trouble. I'm flattered and you are adorable. Um, right, okay. Have you taken any courses in interspatial manipulation? Probably not, huh? Can't say I have. Space-time topology? Nope. Transdimensional theory. Rosemary made an apologetic face. Ah, said Kizzy, clasping her hands over her heart. You're a physics virgin! Okay, okay, we'll keep this simple. She looked around the counter for props. Okay, cool, here. The area above my bowl of porridge, as she gestured, uh, gestured importantly, is the fabric of space. The porridge itself is the sublayer, basically the space in between space, and this groove, she picked up a small black fruit from her plate, is the wayfarer. Oh, I can't wait to see this, Dr. Chef said, resting his top arms on the opposite side of the counter, and yes, there is a character called Dr. Chef, just, just go with it. Kizzy cleared her throat and straightened up. So, here's us. She swooped the berry over the bowl. We've got two ends of space to connect, right? Here and here. She pressed her finger down into the porridge, making indentations on opposite, si uh, opposite ends of the bowl. So we travel to one end, whoosh, and all the people seeing us fly by are like, Oh my stars, look at that totally amazing ship. What genius tech patched together such a thing. And I'm like, oh, that's me, Kizzy Shao. You can name all your babies after me, whoosh. And then we get to our start point. She hovered the berry above the disappearing dent in the porridge. Once we're in position, I turn on the interspatial bore. Did you see it when you flew in? Big old monstro machine strapped to our belly? It's a beast. Runs on ambi cells. Our entire ship couldn't hold the amount of algae you'd need to power it. Oh, and fair warning, it's noisy as hell, so don't freak out while it's doing its thing. We're not blowing up or anything. So, yeah, bore warms up, then we punch. She slammed the berry down into the porridge. And then it gets weird. Weird how, Rosemary said. Well, we're just squishy little three-dimensional creatures. Our brains can't process what goes on in the sublayer. Technically, the sublayer is outside of what we consider normal time. Understanding what's going on in there is like... It's like telling someone, a human, I mean, to see an infrared. We just can't do it. So... In the sublayer, you feel that something is wrong with the world, but you can't put your finger on what it is. It's very, very weird. Have you ever done Daffy? Rosemary blinked. Where she was from, people didn't casually ask about illegal hallucinogens over breakfast. Uh, no, I haven't. Hmm, well, it's kind of like that. 
Your visual perception and sense of time gets all fucked up, but the difference is that you're fully in control of your actions. When you're studying for your tunneling license, that's uh, separate from basic tech study, so believe me when I say I'm super glad I'll never have to set foot in a school again, you have to practice stuff like fixing the engines or entering in commands after taking a dose of Sofro, which is basically a dumbed down government issued version of Daffy. Worst homework ever, I assure you. But you get used to it. She stuck her fingers in the porridge, getting a grip on the hidden berry. Okay, so while we're all tripping balls, the ship's pushing through the sublayer, dropping boys to force the tunnel open. The boys are there for two reasons. One, they keep the tunnel from collapsing, and two, they generate this field made up of all the same strings and particles and stuff that normal space is made out of. Rosemary nodded. Artificial space. Finally, a concept she somewhat understood. But why do that? So that it's an easy ride for anybody travelling through. That's why you don't notice a difference when you tunnel hop. And none of this messes up the space outside? I mean, here in our space? Nope, not if you do it right. That's why we're pros. Rosemary nodded towards the porridge. So how do we get out of the sublayer? Okay, Kizzy said. She started pushing the groove through the porridge. Once we get to our exit point, we burst back through. She shoved her spoon under the groove, catapult style, and raised her fist. Kizzy, said Dr. Chef, his voice even, if you launch porridge all over my nice clean countertop, I won't. I just realised this won't work. My genius demonstration is flawed. She frowned. I can't fold porridge. Here, said Dr. Chef. He handed her two cloth napkins. One for your hands, one for educational purposes. Ah, said Kizzy, cleaning the porridge from her fingers. Perfecto. She held up the clean napkin, gripping two opposite corners. Okay. You know the big grid-like spheres surrounding tunnel openings with all the blinky warning lights and crackly lightning stuff coming off the joints? Those are containment cages. They keep space from ripping open any farther than we want it to. You have to have one cage at each end of the tunnel. She gestured with corners of the napkin. So if we've got one cage at this end and another cage at this end, we've got to construct a tunnel that effectively makes it so this she stretched the corners far apart from one another, is the same thing as this. She brought the corners together. Rosemary frowned. She had a rough idea of how tunnels worked, but she'd never been able to make the idea stick. Okay, so the cages are light years apart. They're not in the same place, but they behave as if they were not the same place? Pretty much. It's like a doorway connecting two rooms, only the rooms are on opposite sides of town. So the only place the distance between those two points has been changed is within the tunnel? Kizzy grinned. Physics is a bitch, right? <laughs> Rosemary stared at the napkin, struggling to make her three-dimensional brain work with these concepts. How do you get the cages in place? Wouldn't it take forever to travel from one end to the other? Gold star for the lady in the pretty yellow top, Kizzy said. You are totally correct. That's why there are two different ways of building a tunnel. The easy way is what we call an anchored punch. These take place in systems that already have existing tunnels connecting them to other places. So, say you want to connect Stellar System A to Stellar System B. Both System A and System B already connect to System C. You drop a cage in System A, you hop through the existing tunnel from System A to System C, then you hop from C to B, you drop the second cage, then you punch back to System A. Rosemary nodded. That makes sense. Sounds like a roundabout way to get there, though. Oh, definitely, and it's rarely a two-hop trip like that, especially if the tunnels connect to different planets within the system. Usually it takes us a few ten days to get between jobs, sometimes more if we have a lot of space to cover. That's part of what Sisix does, charting the fastest ways to get between existing tunnels. Rosemary took a second bun and cracked it open. A puff of steam rose from the fragrant pocket within. What if the system you're tunnelling to isn't connected to anywhere? Aha, then you do a blind punch. What's that? Drop a cage at one end, punch through and find your way to the other side, which is crazy hard to do without the second cage to guide you. Once you get back out, you're working against the clock to get the cage up. Cages are self-constructing, so all you can really do is deploy the pieces and wait a day, but still, you have to deploy it as soon as you get out. 
Having a cage on one end of the tunnel and none on the other makes, th makes things inside unstable. At first it's no problem, but the longer you wait, the faster it starts to tear. If that happens, it all goes to shit. And when the fabric of space goes to shit, you've got a really big problem. So, I mean, there's a bit more, and it's probably about another two or three pages of basically learning about how the FTL in this particular um, universe works. And there's a fair few sections like that where it's just back and forth dialogue. And I don't know, I guess some people might find that off-putting. Personally, I thought it was fine, but it's a very talky book in that sense. There's a lot of characters saying things to each other. It doesn't go too heavily on the descriptive side. There are some passages where it does, for instance. Um, there's one early on uh, part where they have to stop at a big interstellar market on a planet and it it goes into a bit of detail describing all the sights and sounds of it, particularly from the point of view of Rosemary, because she's never been to a place like this before. Um, but a lot of what's put across to the reader is done through dialogue. So I guess in that sense, Socrates probably would have approved. <laughs> was it Socrates that... Yeah, it was Socrates, wasn't it? Socratic dialogues. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, on the whole, um, this isn't anything too heavy. It's a very enjoyable book. And, um, yeah, if you find the idea at all interesting, I, I can definitely recommend it. it. It's a really nice bit of, of maybe more kind of socially minded sci-fi, but there is a, a dose of, of actual explanation of how things work as well. It's not like some sci-fi novels which you could describe as being really soft sci-fi where... Uh, it, it, it never explains anything. It doesn't even attempt to make up an explanation as to why things are happening, why things work the way they do. And um, sometimes those, they, those kind of books can be okay anyway, but um, generally speaking, I personally find them a bit less enjoyable. I like to understand why things are happening. And this book does do a good job of that. It does explain why the things that are happening are happening, why the universe is the way that it is inside this particular imagined space. So that was The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. Um, yeah, this one gets a thumbs up. Pretty good book. We'll definitely be reading the sequel at some point, and uh, I'll be interested to see if anyone else has read it and what they think of it. So that's that for now. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this video, found it useful, and if you did, you can... Hit the like button, you can leave any comments below, you can uh, sub to this channel or check out my main channel if you haven't already, and as always, stay tuned for more.